You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this week's Monday Night Class. Uh, where we're going to be uh, having a look at Ezra. The, uh, you remember a fair few weeks ago now, we looked at the beginning of Ezra when Zerubbabel and Jeshua came back into the land and then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah uh, were involved and they, as a result of that, got the, the temple in Jerusalem built. Well, now we're going to pick up the history uh, again in this class and uh, go from chapter 7 in Ezra to the end of Ezra. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son, the son of Seraiah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Mariaroth, the son of Zarahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abushua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which Yahweh God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all the requests according to the hand of Yahweh his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, the Nephanims into Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. But Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of Yahweh, and to do it and to teach in Israel, statutes and judgments thanks very much indeed uh luke so yeah we uh just try to recap a little bit um you remember that um it was in 536 that cyrus gave the decree that allowed zerubbabel and jeshua to return from babylon uh, and bring the first wave of captives back and they got the foundation of the temple laid and then due to adversaries at work, then it became a problem for them to be able to uh, get the job done. And then they almost turned into an excuse not to work. And that there was a, a gap of some 17 years until the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah. And that got the work started again. Within the space of four years, they'd built the second temple. And then we believe that between, so that's the end of chapter six of Ezra, where they are rejoicing about that. Um, and then we believe that actually Esther fits in between chapters six and seven of Ezra. And then Ezra as a character, so I know we're reading in the book of Ezra, but Ezra himself only appears once we get into chapter seven. Now, up to the end of uh, chapter six, then the book of Ezra has been about the struggles of getting the second temple built. Uh, chapter seven, as we say, is sometime later in history, pro probably some 50 years later. Um, so it's a big gap, isn't it? But it, from chapter seven, there's this huge focus on the house of God, you know, the temple, but it's not any longer about the need to physically build that that's happened. Now it's about the spiritual state of the people. Uh, and this is where Ezra, as an individual, comes onto the scene. So I believe that Ezra in chapter seven, we're talking about 457 um, BC. Uh, and then we'll get on to in later classes, Nehemiah, in, when he would come on around 444, so something around those times anyway. But I think it's interesting to note that the, the natural in terms of them having to physically build the temple is followed by the spiritual. And that's the same in Nehemiah, isn't it, regarding the building the walls of Jerusalem, that the physical walls get built of Jerusalem, and then Nehemiah focuses on the spiritual state of the people. 
they're not supposed to be separate that the natural should be about the spiritual and that's how it should have been with both the temple and the, the city walls but but sadly due to uh, human nature intervention was needed so, so in chapter seven Ezra is now coming onto the scene as another strong leader and he's going to lead more captives home. So the first sort of round, as it were, uh, have come back with Zerubbabel and Jeshua. And now some years later, Ezra is going to be bringing back another round of captives back to Jerusalem. And we learn about Ezra from verse six of chapter seven, that he was a ready scribe. And you know, we're not going to go into absolutely loads of detail. We're, we're planning to go from chapter seven to the end of Ezra today. Um, but th these are things that are definitely enjoyable to look at in more detail. And there's lots of things that you can bring out. But I'm going to just try and bring out a few things today. Uh, th this idea of being a ready scribe. Uh, that, that word in the Hebrew, ready, is only used on three other occasions. Uh, once in Psalm 45, once in Proverbs 22, and once in Isaiah 16. So, you know, for you, you're going to have to look up those uh, to have a look at those. But Isaiah 16, if you find that one, you'll see it's undoubtedly about the Lord Jesus Christ as king. So I'm just going to quickly turn there Isaiah 16 and in verse 5 it's used um, now that, that's 100 percent about the Lord Jesus Christ as king so we understand then that being ready in this this context is a Christ-like quality so I think that's a lovely thing that Ezra being a ready scribe had a Christ-like quality the word of God was something that Ezra seemed to utterly, you know, love. It was his life. In fact, we know that he seems to literally be carrying it around, which in those days, you know, would have been a challenge, wouldn't it? But twice you notice in verse 14 of this chapter, uh, at the end of verse 14, it talks about the Lord thy God, which is in thy hand. Um, or in verse 25, thou Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, that is in thy hand. So it's almost like, it, it, I think that's possibly saying it, it, it is literally in his hand. What a good practical lesson that is for us. We, we all have tiny Bibles available now, don't we? And they're certainly readily available on our phones. Are we ensuring that we have a Bible with us so that we are ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in us? So, you know, that being ready, as a ready scribe means that you're able to talk about the word. And Ezra's understanding of the word drove his life. His, his choice was to put God first. Uh, so having sought to study the word, you know, we, we know that from verse six. Well, we also learn very quickly about Ezra that he was compelled to act upon the word. And what's more, he was compelled to teach it and he inspired others to do the same. Uh, and one thing that becomes clear to me that he got across to Artaxerxes the king was a point that uh, we, we know Cyrus understood as well and we've learned this in earlier studies was that serving the God of Israel needed to be somebody's choice now it's a difficult thing isn't it because when something's the right thing to do in a way you say well there is no choice because it's the right thing to do that's right of course but actually God only wants people who choose his ways and so we see from the king's letter, which is sent with Ezra when he returns to Jerusalem, he take, takes a letter from King Artaxerxes, which is clear that this letter is not just a general letter to, you know, and that Ezra happens to be the fluky one who's carrying it. He's, Ezra's had a conversation with the king. The king knows Ezra. We know that from verse 25 because the king addresses Ezra in, in this letter. But one thing that you can see that the king has come to understand is that God wants people who've chosen his way. So ju just look at this in the letter. Uh, the letter starts in verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the Lord, the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. I made to make a decree that all there, the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. 
And then you see in verse 15 uh, that they can carry the silver and gold with the king and his counsellors that are freely offered unto the God of Israel. So, again, it's interesting that, he, you know, he's making this point in the letter, isn't he, that we, these are people, this is what we want to do. Um, and then in verse 16, again, he talks about the free will offerings or offering willingly for the house of God. So that they're all the same words that are coming through there um, about the free will and offering freely. For Ezra, because he had set his heart to seek the Lord, he could see the necessity to choose Jerusalem over Babylon. And, and, and we consider the fact that perhaps that he had heard that although the, the house of God was physically built now, it wasn't being used effectively. And that the worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel, clearly wasn't where it should be. It needed organisation. And, and this is where Ezra was going to make a difference. Uh, just notice the, the repetition of the house of God in this letter. That This is what the king is sending Ezra to sort out. It's not, he's not worried about him like, you know, Nehemiah later on goes back to sort out the walls of Jerusalem. It's not simply um, that he's being allowed to go and um, organise Jerusalem in, in a sort of just... Uh, uh, a political way, the king understands that Ezra is going to go to sort the worship of the house of God. So, so you see the house of God in the end of verse 16, at the end of verse 17, the house of your God, the, verse 19, the house of thy God, the, verse 20, the house of thy God, verse 23, the house of the God of heaven, uh, verse 24, that this house of God. Um, and then after the letter, the letter finishes in verse 20, at the end of verse 26, um, Ezra, you know, prays and talks about the beautifying of the house of Yahweh. So that this is what this is all about. Ezra is going to be able to go to help with getting the organization of the house of God, the temple sorted. It's about getting temple worship happening again more effectively. So it's not some general note. Um, this is he's going with a real specific purpose. And it's an interesting letter because it not only speaks of Ezra in the third person, it speaks of him in the first person. So in verse 12, Artax says, the king of kings, unto Ezra, and then at points the letter uh, is able to, he's able to show this letter to the rulers when he gets to Jerusalem. So the people that are around, he's able to say, look, I've got permission to, to be doing this work. And so it then refers to Ezra in the third person, so in verse 21, I, even I, Artax, said to the king, do you make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the Lord, the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. So this letter to Ezra also then within it addresses the leaders that are there. So Ezra is referred to in the third person. And then it comes back to addressing Ezra again uh, in verse 25. He says, and thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy hand, that is uh, of thy God, which is in thy hand, set magistrates, judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, teach ye them uh, and know them not. So those that, that don't know about them, they've got to go and do this teaching. So Ezra has the permissions. And he knows that God is using the angels to make things happen. And so we see he, as he prays in verse 27. So he's got this letter now. He's about to kind of get cracking on this long journey. And we see him praying now in verse 27. Blessed be Yahweh, God of our fathers, which has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of Yahweh, which is in Jerusalem. And hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counsellors and before all the king's mighty princes. And then it, perhaps the prayer is finished there. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. I think it's interesting to me to just see just time and again that men and women of faith like Ezra, are able to see God working in their lives. Uh, so uh, that phrase, I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. He absolutely knows that God's hand is directing things here. So just come with me. We'll come back here very shortly, but come to Proverbs chapter three for uh, a lovely cross-reference in this regard. So Proverbs chapter three. 
we're looking here at the inspired advice of David to, to his son, Solomon. I'll read in verse one. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in Yahweh with all thy heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. So the prophet said, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now just come back to Ezra chapter 7 and we're going to pick up a key phrase that runs through the record now. And it brings out how Ezra saw God working in his life. And this is something that you, if you wanted to, you could keep following through Nehemiah as well. We're not going to do that now, but um, certainly an easy thing to do, do afterwards. So chapter seven and verse six, let's just see if we can follow this lovely phrase. The end of verse six of chapter seven, he talks about according to the good hand of his God upon him. Um, Oh, apologies. So, yeah, that's the end of verse six. And then you see that phrase again at the end of verse nine, according to the good hand of his God upon him. Um, then verse 28 as the one we've already seen there. Um, and then if you look, look in chapter eight and verse 18, um, by the good hand of our God upon us um, or halfway through verse 22. Thy, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. Uh, and then finally, in verse 31 of chapter 8, halfway through verse 31, and the hand of our God was upon us. So isn't that lovely? So remember that, the phrase from the Psalm, uh, Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, okay, which says, doesn't it, that um, uh, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So the hand of God is, is upon them. It strikes me that in chapter 8 and verse 22, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. Uh, might well be the source of a verse that we know well from Romans 8. Uh, we know all things work together for good to them that love God. Uh, Romans 8 and verse 28. We also learn from Ezra that he is a man of prayer. And we've said already that verse 27 and halfway through verse 28 are actually a prayer to God. But what, what a great example Ezra is to us. He has this desire to study the word of God with diligence, allow, allowing God's law to guide him in decision making. Um, so that actually for him, it's a free choice. That's true. But it's the right choice because he sees this is what the word of God says. That's what he wants to happen in his life. And then we also see that, that he puts the situations before him into the hands of God through prayer. Now, we noted that the, the letter spoke of Ezra in the third person. We saw that in verse 21 and then addressed him. Um, we notice also just in terms of the, the narrative that it jumps a bit between the third person and the first person. So in Ezra chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, that's the introduction to this whole section. And it really is taking you to him getting to Jerusalem because it's just the introduction that in the third person. But but actually, if we then look at the kind of the rest of the history, so you get through the letter then. And then we pick up after the letter in verse 27 from from verse 27 in chapter seven all the way to the end of the book of Ezra. It's written in the first person by Ezra. So when you come into chapter eight, for example, these are the chief of their fathers. This is the genealogy of them that went up with me from Babylon in the reign of Artaxerxes, the king. The me there is Ezra. Now, because Ezra has got a mission about getting the, the temple worship happening or at least happening more effectively, he needs Levites and priests to go with him. However, as they're about to get going, we come across a problem. So look at this in chapter eight and verse 15. I gathered them together to the river that runneth to a harbour, and there abode we in tents three days. And I viewed the people and the priests and found that none of the sons of there, none of the sons of Levi. So, so Ezra's gathered the willing ones together, but realises that without the Levites to serve and support the work of the priests in the temple, 
then he's going to struggle to get the temple worship happening as it should. Now, we should just say here that whilst it's true that there wasn't enough Levites, the reaction of the people in general, not just the Levites, uh, to return with Ezra seems pretty pathetic. But we know that there are 1,496 people who respond. And I know that compared to our efforts, you know, you might be thrilled if uh, you put on a, a, you know, any sort of special effort and you've got anything like that amount of number. But if we get the perspective here, this is from hundreds of thousands of Jews in captivity. So it must have been embarrassing for Ezra to have got the king to agree to all this and then hardly anyone turn up. And I almost think, well, you know, if we go, we can't, we can't do the mission. But Ezra doesn't give up here. Having perceived that there aren't any Levites, he sends specifically for some Levites that he clearly knew. So, so you see in verse 16, it says, then I sent for Eliza, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jarib, uh, another Elnathan, for Nathan, for Zechariah, for Meshulam, chief men also for jo uh, Joyrib, and for Elnathan, men of understanding. So, so he gets hold of these guys, um, and uh, like the fact that they're men of understanding is, is a useful thing. I wanted to just note for your margin there against the idea of men of understanding that there is only one other time when exactly that same form of the Hebrew is used. Uh, so it's a reasonably common word, but you can kind of use a, a tool Bible hub and find kind of the exact time when that exact word is used. And that's in Nehemiah 8 and verse 7. And we're not going to turn there now, but if you looked at it then, and we'll, we'll look at it, uh, if not next week, the week after, um, and you'll see that it's about people who are teaching. OK, so these were good teachers. Uh, that would be really helpful, wouldn't it? Because their whole job, we know from chapter seven and verse 25, the king's command is they go to teach. So, so he's put, clearly got men who were teachers um, involved here. So that, that was a good thing. So he's able to sort of get his work done there. And then he instructs these men to go and get other people. So in verse 17, he sent, I sent them with commandment unto Idu, the chief at the palace, uh, Kephira, um, and I told them that they should, what they should say unto Idu and his brethren, the Nephilims, at the, the uh, place Kasafir, they should bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. So he's got this job now to go and they've got this job to go and get some more ministers. So uh, by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, Cherubiah with his sons and his brethren, 18, Hashabiah with him, Jeshiah, the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons, 20, also the Nethanim, whom David and the princes has ported for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanims, all of them were expressed by name. Now, the AV in verse 18 um speaks of a man of understanding uh, and most versions have then namely in place of and so let's just read that again verse 18 they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Le uh, Mali, the son of levi the son of israel namely sherebiah so can you see that what it's suggesting then is the man of understanding is sherebiah now, this word understanding is a different word to the word you see in verse 16 in the Hebrew, but it's a lovely word to have used to someone. Um, it's not about teaching where the first word was about teaching. This one is about understanding an application of the word in life. So, so what a lovely thing to this man was somebody who was clearly wise. He applied the word of God always in his life. And his name means, Sherebiah, means Yahweh has brought heat. And we notice that with him is Hashabiah, whose name means Yahweh has regarded. And then Jeshiah, whose name means Yahweh has saved. And we know from verse 20 that they now have the help of 220 Nethanim. Now, you may remember that in the days of Joshua, so going a long time back in history now, aren't we? Where, you know, Joshua, you know, I know back in when they first left Egypt and come into the land, that when they came into the land, the Gibeonites tricked Joshua into saving them. They pretended that they were people from miles and miles away. And although Joshua came to realize they'd tricked them, Joshua had promised that he would save them and he kept his word and gave them the task of being servants, which was to be water carriers and woodcutters. 
So these Gibeonites, they had this job. And so they, they became amalgamated in uh, Israelite society, but this was their role. Now, the word Nethanim means given ones. And it seems that David formalized the role of those Gibeonites who had become merged into Israel um, when he was formalizing the arrangements in the temple. So these people were given as servants to the Levites. So it, what then we've got is that the priests have got Levites to support their work. And then the Nethanims support the Levites in their work. So now having got all the kind of right people in place to, so that the work could actually happen, they've now got the priests, they've got the Levites to support them, they've got the Nethanim to support them. Ezra is now ready to start the, this long and arduous journey back to Jerusalem. And we say long because it was one of around 900 miles. Ezra knew it was going to be a dangerous journey. Uh, verse 21 says that they've got little ones with them, you know, so this is a toughie, isn't it? So I'm in mean, chapter 8 uh, and verse 21. Um, so these are families that are making this brave decision to be willing to say this is our choices. We would rather go back to Jerusalem. We don't want to be in Babylon. Like, and, and that wasn't an easy thing. Clearly, they'd got comfortable lives, many of them, in Babylon, and yet they were willing to do this. It, it's so good. Now, we notice here that Ezra wasn't comfortable asking the king for support or when he told him that the hand of God was with him. So just see that in verse 22. I was ashamed to require the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we'd spoken unto the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. Uh, that's a real, real thing, isn't it, in our lives too, that you know we talk about our faith um, to people and then we're sort of very aware that actually I've got to be careful now uh, what I say in front of this person. Um, and I guess there, there's things that perhaps we should consider in our lives that should we at times um so, so for example is it kind of wise to be asking for pay rises things like that when we're at the same time saying we completely trust that god is looking after us in our lives um and you know i'm not saying that there might be genuinely times when you think that is the right thing to do but um yeah clearly that's something that needs thought isn't it that we think to ourselves before talking to people when we've tried to make that witness and that obviously that's the right thing to do to make the witness and, and how good it is for men to see that we do truly rely on the hand of god in our lives and not simply what we can provide ourselves or you know what the what strength the world can give us now, Ezra and his company, of course, as we've come to expect, you know, make this a matter of prayer. And so you see that in verse 23, we, we fasted and besought our God for this. And he was entreated of us. Um, just such a good example. Again, I, those of you who enjoy Bible marking, the, the way that for me, I mark up a prayer in the Bible is, you know, I just take any colour pencil and just go down the line of the margin where, where the prayer is so that it kind of stands out for me that this seems to be a prayer uh, in, in Scripture. So this one, you know, it's just that verse 23 that I've marked up there just to consider the fact that here they are praying about their journey. Now, because they're carrying precious things, and they really are carrying a lot of precious things, that the temple vessels of gold and silver, they've been given this job, they can take these things back with them. Ezra knows that they would be very susceptible to attack. And he gives the, the vessels into the care of the Levites. Now, we can see from verse sort of 25, uh, it says, it well, verse 25, separated 12 of the chief of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, 10 of their brethren with them, weighed unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offerings of the house of our God. So that they've got these things, it says in verse 26, the amount that they weighed. Um, and yeah, he, he weighs it to them so they know exactly what it is that's been given to these men. And we read that they've got a hundred talents of uh, silver and a hundred talents of gold. Now, Trying to research the weight of a talent isn't completely easy, but, but most seem to agree that it's around 34 kilograms, a hundred, uh, sorry, a talent is around 34 kilograms. So along with the other vessels too, 
they're carrying over seven tons of precious metals in a convoy of families. It's pretty incredible, isn't it, to think of what it is that they are carrying. Some task. And Ezra instructs them in verse 28. He says, I said unto them, you are holy unto Yahweh. The vessels are holy also. The silver and the gold are a free will offering unto Yahweh, God of your fathers. Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the house of our fathers at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord and house of Yahweh. So he, Ezra's given them these instructions. Um, the priests and the Levites receive the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem and to the house of our God. And then the convoy sets off uh, in verse 31. We departed from the river harbour on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem and the hand of our God was upon us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lie in wait, by the way. Uh, the lie in wait is the idea of ambushes. So this was, again, like this long journey. They got little ones with them. They got all this stuff. They're aware that it could be easily be ambushments along the way. And yet they see the hand of God as he delivers them and helps them to, to get to Jerusalem. And we also realise from that that it takes them four months to cover this journey. Um, we, we know it takes that long because chapter seven and verse nine um, tells us uh, yeah, essentially that, that uh, it's a four month journey. So having got to Jerusalem then and abode for three days, they, they then head to the temple, uh, verse 33, on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, and with him was Eliezer, the son of Phinehas, with him was Jezebel, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, uh, the son of Binui, Levites, by number and by weight of everyone, all the weight was written at that time. Also, the children of those who had been carried away, which have come up out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, 12 bullocks for all Israel, 96 rams, 70 uh, and 7 lambs, 12 he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And they delivered the king's commission and to the king's lieutenants and to the governors on this side of the river. And they furthered the people and the house of God. Now, it seems to me that there's a good practical lesson here for ecclesial life that those who had trust of the silver it was counted out to them wasn't it and then it was counted back in um, in verse 33 and 34 so we should never um, shy away from that and say well you know it's of course we just simply must just trust people just give, give them some money actually it's, it's just good sense to do that these were godly men but Ezra counted out to them and it was expected to be counted back in. Um, that was how I do that. And of course, in doing that, you're actually then stopping temptation being put in the way of somebody to, to possibly to think to themselves, or maybe I could uh, take a bit from here. So it's always see that as a really good scriptural thing that, you know, in, in our um, organizations, if there's times that we're going to uh, put money into somebody's hands, that we, it's, it's right, there's some reckoning that goes in place with that. You know, that it's counted out, it's counted back in. I also think there's a lovely spiritual lesson here that um, they head to the temple. Having, so they've got to uh, Jerusalem. They've had three days. And for me, as soon as you see three days mentioned, as it is there at the end of verse 32, you, you just can't help your mind go to the Lord Jesus and then it suddenly struck me that for the Lord Jesus, he had set his face to go to Jerusalem in the same way that they had done. You know, that's what he did, didn't he? He decided that's where, they, by his free will, that's where he's going. And he headed to Jerusalem. When he was there, he abode three days and nights in the tomb. And his work had led captivity captive. You know, and I think about the fact that this is what these guys are doing. They're leading the captives um, uh, away from that. So they're, they're taking captivity captive in that sense. They're bringing liberty. Uh, and crucially, his work, the Lord Jesus Christ's work, enabled the vessels to take their place in the house of God. You know, that's what his work is all about, isn't it? That the chosen ones of the Lord God can take their place in his house um, and here we see the vessels coming back into the house of God. Uh, and we then see from verse 36 that they, they deliver the letter from the king and no doubt start to implement that what the command was. And just we've already mentioned this, but just look at chapter seven again in verse 25 to remember what he, they were able to do. 
So verse 25 of chapter 7, remember this is the commandment from the king. Thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, teach ye them that know them not. So they, their job, what they got there, was to implement this. So here they are in verse 36, uh, and it says that uh, they delivered the king's commission. Now, what I think is lovely about this um, is that the delivering of the king's commission furthers the people. Can you see that in the end of verse 36? It furthers the people and the house of God. Now, the reason I think that's lovely is that word furthered means exalts or lifts up. So that, in other words, the impact of what it is that they're doing gives people a lift. What is it they're doing? Remember, again, they're going to teach people that don't know about the word of God. And so as they're going out to do that, that gives people a lift. I, I just love that. It's just such a basic thing, isn't it? That the impact that the word of God can have on us is to lift us. Now, sadly, whenever humans are involved, things never stay great for long and things do go wrong. And here in Ezra, now in chapter nine, we realize that things have gone really quite badly reports as the word of God's going out through these people that um, are, you know, the, as it says, the magistrates and the judges uh, from Ezra 7 verse 25. So as these people are going out and they're teaching the word of God, reports then start coming back to show just how far away from the word of God people are. And not just people who don't know the word of God, but even people who should know the word of God. And this brings real distress to Ezra. What's happening is that some of the people who settled in the land already, particularly the leaders, have started mixing with the Canaanites in the land, not to bring them into the hope of Israel, the absolute opposite. Rather, they are now going along with their practices so let's pick up the record now, chapter nine and verse one. When these things were done, the princes came to me saying, so these people that have been sent out to, to teach the word of God are now coming back to Ezra saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. So no wonder the worship wasn't going well and Ezra had to come back and do something. But I don't think he realized that it, would, it had gone as badly as this that even the priests and the Levites that were supposed to be back leading the worship had done the opposite. They had got involved in the worship of the heathen. So, so they've not separated themselves from the people of the land. Now, ju just in terms of that word separate, Ezra understands separation. So look at verse chapter 8 and verse 28. I said unto them, you are holy. You are separate. OK, the vessels are holy. They're separate. That's what holy means, doesn't it? To be separate. But actually, not necessarily these particular ones that Ezra's with, but people that have gone back already, then doing the opposite. They're not separate. Uh, they've not separated themselves from the people of the land doing verse one of chapter nine again, according to their abominations. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. For they've taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of the land. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. So it's a grim situation. It's clearly not a one-off mistake. Rather, it seems like it's a policy that's been implemented to integrate with the world. So Ezra's in utter disbelief at this. He knows that the whole point in the 70-year captivity that, that God put Israel through or Judah through was to teach them not to do this. How can we show that? Well, come with me to Psalm 106. So we'll come back here again, but come to Psalm 106. This is one of those places in scripture that kind of recounts history. You know, time and again, you see it through the scriptures, don't you? Uh, scriptures recounted. 
And here in Psalm 106, it talks about when Israel first came into the land under Joshua and they were commanded to get rid of the nations. And we know that anyone who wanted to join Israel, well, they could be spared, you know, Rahab, uh, Ruth, you know, others. But but these nations were wicked. And so God didn't want them mingling with the nations. If somebody could see Israel, what Israel were about and their, their ways and trying to follow God's ways and they wanted to join that, they were absolutely welcome. But Israel were not OK to go and mix with them. Now, sadly, back in these days, so this is long before Ezra, Israel didn't stay separate. So you read in Psalm 106 and verse 34, they did not destroy the heathen, the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols, which became a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, to demons, to idols. We know that is. So our word mingled in Ezra chapter 9 um, and verse 2, they have mingled themselves, is the same word that you can see in Psalm 106 and verse 35. So they'd done it before. Now, look what that led to. Then we, we've picked this up, verse 36, 37, 38 of the psalm. They're sacrificing their sons and their daughters to idols. Now, eventually, God sent them into captivity. We know that. So, they, yes, they were brought into the land under Joshua. They were told to get rid of the, the, the Canaanites that they didn't. And God was so upset by this because of what it led to. And we're just being able to read there. So eventually God sends them um, away into captivity to, to help them to learn to trust in him. Uh, so it says in the psalm and verse 46, um, he made them also, God made them to be pitied of all those that carried them captives Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. So this, the whole idea of the psalm was that, please, Lord God, save us from, the, from where we've been scattered because, and we know we've been scattered because of that type of behaviour. So looking back then, just hold this, and I put in my margin in against verse 46 of the psalm, Ezra 9 and verse 9. So there it says, he made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them in captive. And if you look in Ezra 9, as Ezra is now praying about this situation, he says in Ezra 9 and verse 9, we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. So Ezra can see that God has caused them to be pitied as the psalm says, Psalm 106 and verse 46, of those that carry them into captivity. But how had things got so bad? You know, so back now in Ezra chapter 9, we <clears throat> are looking at this situation and thinking, how on earth could it have got quite like this? Well, it may be that having got the temple built, you know, because back before Ezra was around, some of the Jews perhaps fell into a mindset that they were sorted now as if the temple itself just the building was the magic building that cured all of their sin and gave them license to live as they liked years earlier the prophet isaiah had made a prophecy and i'd like to turn to this one again actually so again keep ezra 9 but come to isaiah chapter 66 now, the idea of thinking that the temple was something that they just by having the temple that they could live as they liked was something that happened time and again in Israel's history. So, for example, in the days of Shiloh, uh, when Eli and his sons were, were there, um, they trusted in the ark. Uh, and then in the days of Jeremiah. We learn from Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 26, for example, that they trusted in the temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Oh, no, we're OK. So as long as they had that. And in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, they, they seem to be doing just the same things where they thought that by having the temple that they were sorted. 
And so it might have been that having built the temple in the days of Zerubbabel and Jeshua, that some of them just went off now thinking, oh, well, now, now we've got the temple. Uh, now we can come and, you know, give our offerings. We can live as we want to live. And so they've got now into this place. But the prophet Isaiah had said many years earlier in Isaiah 66 and verse 1, Thus saith Yahweh, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye will build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all think these things have my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Now, the word trembled is only used six times, twice here. You see it then again in verse five. And chronologically, we only come across two occasions after Isaiah has prophesied this. And they're both in Ezra. So come to Ezra chapter nine. And Ezra nine and verse four. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. And actually, we see it again in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 3 those that tremble at the commandment of our God. So, Ezra now is bringing together those people who will willingly tremble at the word of God. You know, they're not just thinking that by having some temple, they're OK. They understand Isaiah 66, that it's not God doesn't need that. What is what God wants is our hearts and the way in which we're living our lives. And this becomes such a big lesson for us, doesn't it, that we cannot allow ourselves to think that by going into sort of ritual things which all of us do in a way we can't help ourselves by the, the habits we put ourselves into which are in themselves are not bad they, they could be really good like going to the temple is such a good thing but actually it can't be that we think that those things alone will save us and therefore we are able to live as we like we've got to make right choices and one right choice that we must make is not to mingle with the world. God knows the ways of the world and he knows that it will rub off on us and we'll end up killing our sons and our daughters. Not, of course, by putting them in literal fires, but spiritually destroying them. So, so in Ezra chapter nine, Ezra prays about this situation. So, so let's pick up, you know, Ezra's prayer again. So from verse five, so I've got it again, it's just marked up for me. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my heaviness and having rent my garments and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto Yahweh, my God, and said, oh, my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity and spoiler, and to confusion of face it is, as it is this day. So he says, yeah, so clearly Ezra from his prayer, you understand, he knows that, look, we were sent into captivity because of our sins. And now he says, verse 8, for a little space, grace has been shown from Yahweh our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, our oh God, what shall we say after this? We have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by the by servants of the prophet, saying, the land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the land, with their abominations which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not your daughters and their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this, 
Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Would it not thou be angry with us, till thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Yahweh, God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses. We cannot stand before thee because of this. Now, throughout this prayer, Ezra draws on different scriptures, as men of faith do. Uh, you'll be able to just run through your margin and see connections to Daniel. Uh, you see, like Daniel, he's willing to be counted with the sinners. He, he speaks of our iniquities. And you know, Daniel 9 is the famous uh, prayer in, in Daniel where you'd see that. But sadly, Ezra is so depressed by the situation. He, he just can't see a way out. And so he's saying at the end of this, verse 15, we, we can't stand before you because of this. And it seems as if Ezra feels at an absolute loss. Ezra's prayer does have an impact, though. And sometimes that's perhaps the right thing to even when we can't see a right way. We, we pray about the situation. Then even our prayer, if we're with others, may impact others. And, and here we see that in chapter 10 and verse 1, that when Ezra had prayed, when he'd confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. I think this is amazing here that a remarkable young man seems to step forward now. And he's someone who clearly knows the scriptures. Look at verse three. Now, therefore, he says, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law now let me first show you how he knows his scriptures and then see what else we know about him to see why this is such a great act of faith on his part well come with me to psalm 130 so again hold this and come to psalm 130 to see how this young man seems to know his, his, his scriptures here ezra had finished his prayer by saying in Ezra 9 and verse 15, we cannot stand before thee because of this. Yeah, now, this man was now saying, just to have a look at Ezra 10 and the end of verse 2, yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. So Ezra said, we cannot stand before thee because of this. This young man said there is hope in Israel um, concerning this thing. How does he know that? Well, Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? We can't stand. If God marks iniquities, who, none of us can stand. But, verse 4, there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning, yea, more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous in redemption. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So it seems that here in Ezra chapter 10, this man in exhorting and saying, look, there is hope. He knows that Ezra's right. You know, if thou Lord shows mark iniquity, who can stand? We can't stand before you this day. It's so awful what's happened here. But there is hope because with God, there is forgiveness. So Ezra, we sure was able to see that, that God was willing to forgive. Now, the reason we think Shechaniah uh, in verse 2, the son of Jehiel is so remarkable, is that Jehiel, his father, was one of the men who had taken a wife from the nations. Uh, we know that from um, verse 26 
of chapter 10. So, yeah, amazing faith on his part that he, even though he knew that his own father had been involved in this, was able to say, we've got to do something about this. Now, of course, the right course of action was that they confess their sins and do something. That's always the right course of action with any sin. Confess and do something about it. In this case, what they were told to do was to separate from these wives and separate from the evil practices of the nation. So see that in verse uh, 11 of chapter 10. And now, therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from these strange wise. Now, for this, we might look at this something like this and think, well, that seems incredibly harsh. But, but it's really important that we remember what's happening here. This is not a Rahab scenario where someone with an incredibly dodgy background in her part uh, turns to God and joins the hope of Israel. She was absolutely welcome, wasn't she? As soon as she said, I want to be part of you, of course you can, no problem at all. No doubt any that did that wouldn't be a strange wife any longer in that sense. So, so don't think to yourselves that this is about people who have chosen the God of Israel. What's happening here is absolutely horrific. Read again chapter 9 and verse 1. Chapter 9 and verse 1. They've not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to their abominations. So what abominations were the people of the land committing? And just to make sure that we see that this abomination is what's going on, just see it in the end of verse 11 uh, of chapter 9, where Ezra says they, you know, they filled the land with their abominations. Um, and we could see it again in verse 14, these abominations. What then were the abominations that the people of the land were committing? Well, we know one of them. It's come to chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 31. And you have already know this from Psalm 106, but we're going to just point out that this is the abominations that they are committing. And it helps you to realise why this was so right that they come well away from this type of behavior. So Psalm 106, uh, sorry, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 31, we read, apologies, thou shalt not do so unto Yahweh thy God, for every abomination to Yahweh which he hateth have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. These are the abominations of the nations. And you might say, well, that's miles away in history. Well, uh, I think it's still a fair point, but come with me to 2 Chronicles 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And this is now very recent history, really. 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 3. And see the abominations of um, Ahaz. So Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, it says in 2 Chronicles 28, verse 1. Um, and yeah, he didn't do what he should be doing. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, made also molten images for Baalim. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Himon and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen. So when we're coming back to Ezra chapter 9, do not pity these people that Ezra is saying, separate from this, because their, their behaviour is disgusting. It's utterly abominable. It's so wrong. The right course of action here was to get away from this, this situation. Now, of course, this is a, an unbelievably kind of grim situation, but certainly we've got to be willing still to take lessons to our lives. If ever we become involved in something which is clearly wrong, and don't think we need to go to this type of extreme, if ever we're involved in something which is clearly wrong, the right course of action is to confess that it's wrong, which in itself acknowledges that God's way is right, and then do something, change. So may we then remember that in our own lives, with Yahweh, there is mercy, with him, is plenteous redemption if we're willing to do that in our lives. So in our study next week, we will get on to Nehemiah 
and start to set the history there before looking at the final of the prophets before uh, after the exile uh, in looking at Malachi. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.